Now, what a crazy time we live in right now with the social distancing and the coronavirus. Uh, pretty crazy. And um, of course, there's a lot of you that are older than me. I'm 50 years old, but uh, pretty crazy just looking back at my life and thinking about this time right here. You know, other older people have gone through somewhat similar things, but this is this is different. And you know, when I thought about it, it really, and I had a, a client bring it up this week that, uh, you know, white-tailed deer, really, They've been practicing social distancing a lot longer than we have. And I can see the means for social distancing. It's going to make me even think about germs and whatever's going on going forward in my life and, and uh, spreading germs, whatever it might be. I'll probably never look at spreading germs, grabbing a doorknob or pushing a hotel button, the other, you know, go up an elevator the same again. But again, whitetails have been practicing social distancing for a long time. And we think about that and think about how they live compared to each other, how they live their daily lives. I think it helps you give a good perspective going forward in your deer hunt and how you can have a better deer hunt this fall. And, and I'll go back to a story that I talk about in my Mature Buck Success by Design because this social distancing thing when it comes to deer herd and deer hunting has been so critical that it was my actual intro and conclusion in a way in my Mature Buck um, Success by Design book uh, as my third book. And the reason for that is I talk about in the intro, Mature Buck, gets away from the does and fawns, gets away from the younger bucks. He goes out and finds his safe and happy place. And all of a sudden, a couple of young bucks come in. He stands up postures, he spooks them away. He goes back even further. He just wants to find his happy place. He wants to separate himself from the rest of the herd. I talk about in the conclusion. As a lot of you know, I had a tribute to my dad back in October, but on October 1st of 2019, my father passed away and was able to spend some great time with them even into the days leading up to that time. And, um, and I, I referred to my dad as that older mature buck in the conclusion and how as he aged um, that he would really like to distance himself from the rest of the family. And he would play games with us, you know, breakfast, fun time, all that. He still participated, but he also liked to go sit on his recliner, put his crossword puzzle on his, on his uh, leg and as I've talked about many times when we went out there he'd pretend he's sleeping we knew he wasn't sleeping but he'd have his book there and uh, he just wanted to be left alone and relax and there's nothing wrong with that and if you think of that and apply it to not only mature box but the entire deer herd you'll be on track for not only finding deer and aligning them on your private land but for finding them on public land so this applies anywhere and I'll talk about first separation of the sexes I talked about in an article many years ago, I started talking about separation of the sexes, maybe 2006, 2008, sometime around there. I wrote an article back at that time, maybe 2007, 2008, 2006, I'm not really sure. I started talking about that because that's what I see in the whitetail woods. There's no studies for that. There's no peer reviewed studies. It's just being on hundreds of parcels, lots of hunting lands, lots of public land. And you get to see this over and over again that bucks, does they just don't get along for the most part of the year and this even extends to the deer yard john azoga told me long ago that a lot of times those mature bucks inhabit the fringe areas of the deer yard and what's cool about that is they can reach brows that other deer can't reach let's say they can reach seven foot high brows mature doe might reach six foot and a, uh, immature buck and then a young fawn they might be able to reach five feet of brows you know brows five foot in there by standing up and reaching that brows and as i look at clients we're in uh uh, towards the end of March right now and I've been on a lot of clients lately and I'll be on a client parcel out in the woods which is a great place to separate, my, separate myself socially from everybody else but being out in the woods is awesome and what you notice is there's I've been on some properties where there's pellets on top of pellets on trails many many trails you can tell there's a big herd of deer there and they're just not finding the sheds and it's because it's a big pile of does and fawns, could be 20, 50, 100, and those older bucks just wanna separate themselves and get away and it's no wonder they're not finding those mature buck sheds that they do have on their property in the fall. I noticed that around here, we don't find a lot of sheds on our property here, the deer are gone. They're going back to their summer haunts or spring haunts during the, during the winter time and they're really distancing themselves. And as they age, they have a ever shrinking little brat pack they like to be a part of. When, they, when they're older, they have two, three that they like. And then a lot of times you have that solitary seven or eight year old buck that's living by himself somewhere just like when I talk about my dad in the book and uh, and that mature buck that likes to find his happy place and you see that all the time if you don't have space for it if you don't have those layers of cover 
then you're not going to be able to separate the deer. They like to be separated. They like to be apart from each other, whether it's in bedding areas, whether it's in a food source, multiple food sources, each and having their different line of movement into various food sources that all have the same, uh, same diversity and variety planted in the food source, but they like to separate. You typically have does, of course, closer to food, bucks behind does, you don't have it mixed in except for the rut. And even then, I've seen a lot of mature bucks that will take a doe to a little corner somewhere, a little hollow where he can have them all to himself so he doesn't have to sit there and fight off young bucks and old bucks over and over again in a big doe spot. Can you imagine the stress that he goes through if he's sitting in that doe area? They like to separate. Separation of the sexes is so, so critical. Now for a second point, we have the separation of sexes. We'll take it one step further, just like I talk about that buck that gets up postures, chases away some young bucks. Bucks like to separate too. You typically don't see a lot of older bucks or, or the oldest buck in the neighborhood hanging out with a bunch of youngsters. Those youngsters, I think, are stressful to them. They make bad choices. They make bad decisions. That mature buck has become mature because he's a solitary thinker. He's an in independent thinker. He does things on his own. And when he's done that on his own, it's actually kept him alive through all those years, and that's how he's become mature. So that happens just naturally. And I think a lot of the decisions are based on stress. The older that mature buck becomes, the less stress he can, he can tolerate. He certainly doesn't want to be around all those does and fawns. He doesn't want to be around those youngsters, and he doesn't want to be with other mature bucks, especially when you get into the heart of the season. Unfortunately, a lot of the science out there for bucks will tell you that you can't hold a lot of mature bucks or hold the attention of bucks in a small parcel, and that couldn't be further from the truth. All the studies apply to thousands of acres of public land, big private land holdings, and they can't do those studies on these small little micro parcels that are highly um, improved and each carry a different type of habitat. So you really start to confine movement during the daylight hours to very select properties. And if you don't have separate types of habitat and food sources on your land, you're not gonna have separate bucks on your land. But even on a 30 acre parcel, you could have three or four mature bucks that are focusing on that daylight food source that you offer in private land every single day. A little bit harder on public land because there's big, scattered, adequate food sources. They don't, they don't have those high quality food sources and it's, that's why it's so difficult to manage a property with ag land all around you. Ag land is bad for private land, for managing deer herds, because deer can enter that 80 acre field from just about anywhere. And, and if that's their food source, what happens if it's plowed under the middle of November? What happens if it's picked, if it's beans in October? What happens if the beans turn brown in September and they don't have any other choices? It's always changes, there's nothing to find. And that's how you separate the deer behind, by having small, very defined food sources, small meaning a few, day, few acres or less that you can actually move deer and separate those deer and separate those bucks on a daily basis. And finally, that separation of sexes, separation of bucks. And of course, does like to separate too. You have to have separate doe family groups. That's why I like linear food sources because they'll line up along that food source in a linear fashion. You can pull more deer closer to the food source. Then you leave a lot more space behind for bucks. So you have to have that separation of the sexes, separation of bucks, even separation of does. And finally, you have to have the balance of separation. What I mean by that? is you go to the UP of Michigan where there's a heavy baiting culture and you'll go 200 yards into a swamp on a little knoll back there and you'll find all kinds of beds because that's where the does and fawns have been bedded. And a lot of times they're listening to that hunter driving with his ATV and that's why they get there the last five minutes of daylight if they even come to that bait pile at all. And they know when you're coming in and out, they're bedded about 200 yards away. Where in this ag land, those does might be 50 yards away, 30 yards off that food source. There's that balance. Then the bucks in that UP setting, they might be a half mile behind those does, at least a quarter mile. And it really depends on the habitat. If you have big, broken swamp, and then you have a hardwood regeneration area, half mile away, that's probably where that buck's gonna be. So if you're searching on public land, you're gonna have a lot bigger balance of separation and movement. The does are gonna be a lot further from their main food sources, like a clear cut, maybe a hardwood regeneration, or maybe a swamp edge where there's a diversity of habitat and then those bucks are gonna be a quarter mile, half mile, sometimes three quarters of a mile away from those does as they relate to every day. So it's pretty cool because on public land, you can get into near some buck bedding areas. I'd, I'd never waste my time looking for a buck bed on public land, big public land holdings. I'm talking about 63,000 acre Shawnee Forest or 100,000 acre Wayne uh, National Forest down in Ohio, those kind of holdings are the tens of thousands of federal land up in the UP that I hunt. 
but you can find bedding areas and you find them by finding the separation, by finding the room for separation, meaning here's food, here's Rideau's bed, it's adequate bedding, then you don't have adequate bedding, maybe it's marshes and swamp, and now you find an island that's a halfway, and guess what, there's that buck. He's relating to those individual doe movements, but he wants that separation of bedding. He finds it, and that's that balance. In Northern Ohio, that balance might cover 150 yards because there's just small little pockets of cover and a lot of flat ag land. They don't have a lot of structure to bed in and bedding structure. So it's 150 yard movement or 100 to 200. Mixed ag like this might be two to 400 yards where you find that food source, you find does bedding close within 100 yards, 50 yards at most to that food source and then you have bucks two to 400 yards away from that food source. In the UP of Michigan, in wilderness settings, in big woods of, hard, of Pennsylvania, big woods of Kentucky, and big unbroken tracks of native grass prairie land out west, you might find that bucks take that space and they can be a three quarters of a mile to a mile away from that food source and that's that balance of separation. So, so think about it. Separation of the sexes, separation of each other, whether it's bucks or does, and then think about that balance of separation. Think about how you can apply those concepts and what you need to do as far as the food, screening of that food source so you can pull bedding behind that screening, creating adequate bedding, not perfect, but you at least have some bedding opportunity behind that screening, and then finding where those bucks bed. And as it relates to all of this, buck bedding comes last. You have to have the food, you have to have the does, you have to have that screening before the does, you have to pull those does close to the food, sor food sources, and then you can actually stick those bucks on that small private parcel of 30 acres, 20 acres, 40 acres, and you can have that layered bedding. And if you multiply that by three or four on your property, all coming to a common area, even with separation, to represent that bottom of the funnel of daylight movement, then that's how you put it all together. But it all starts with the food, the does, then the bucks, and it starts with that social distancing that deer have been doing since the dawn of time. They like to separate from each other. There's a lot of bio biological reasons for that. Um, I'll finish with a cool little story. I was hunting in October up in the UP of Michigan. It was that typical cold front night that I like to hunt. The season opens the first, I believe it was about the seventh or eighth, somewhere around there. I'm sitting on a small little corner food plot where I had bedding access to my left that went through some conifer that I'd cut out. This is going back into about 2002. So I'd cut out a travel corridor to the end of this food, and then the deer would follow that long linear food plot around the corner to a three acre field in the middle. The three acre field in the middle is about 150 yards away. I'm watching some deer feed in front of me. They came out just like clockwork. They've come in from the west, northwest winds blowing my son away from the food. I'm looking out, the deer come in, and they're fiddling around. All of a sudden I hear deer blowing on the three acre field 150 yards in front of me. A bunch of does came around the corner and at that time, which was one of the older bucks in the neighborhood, it was a really nice three-year-old buck that came out around the corner following those does and he was just a little gamey. So imagine those does and fawns that hadn't seen likely by trail camera and personal observation, they hadn't seen that three-year-old out on that plot during the daylight because he was just feeling gamey enough and sure of himself enough and confident to get out on that food source and get a little bit of ruddy and uh, his testosterone levels are probably starting to flow a little bit. And uh, they saw him for the first time and they social distanced themselves quickly. They ran right around the corner, right to me and that buck followed. And that's that separation that they crave. That's an example of that, that separation. He was separated during the daylight for all summer. All of a sudden they see him, they don't know what to expect. He was probably making a rub or scrape, might have even grunted, and they just take off and run. They're not used to it. So think about that. You know, I hope you're being safe out there. We're trying to do our best. I'm trying to work in the woods as much as I can. Um, and that's where we do work all the time. I hope you're healthy, and I hope you enjoy this analogy. And it really does relate. And think about how deer have been doing that for many, many years. And uh, think about how that relates to your hunt this fall, your herd management, your scouting on public land, and you'll be on track for finding a better whitetail herd and hunt this fall.